Good evening, everyone. We're thrilled to welcome you for the launch of the second edition of our Women for Change initiative. The whole team is behind the camera. We're very excited. As you might know, we were supposed to do this in London at the Barbican Centre, but with the news and the new restrictions in the UK, we decided to make it a fully digital event. You know us. We want this event to be inspiring, to be challenging, to be stimulating and make you want to take action. But most of all, what we want is for you to be safe and healthy. So here we are. Tonight's theme is pretty special. The last few years have been very intense. Whether we are referring to the health crisis that has been paralyzing us for the last two years, or the climate crisis that is growing and affecting more and more people unequally, or to the global economical and political crisis that are deepening the inequalities across the globe. So we want to explore this topic that is being talked about more and more and to bring to change now to touch to it. Women on the front line of crisis. Well, if you know us, you know that at Change Now, we love positive, powerful, and unifying words because that's what we do. We think about actions. We think about solutions. That's how we want to see the world. But the reality is there are no other words for war, violence, or crisis. So tonight, we will take some more time uh, to explore a subject that requires a great deal of attention and most of all, understanding from everyone. And I'm talking here about the impacts that crises of any kind have on women, be it political, social, climatic, health, all crises. It is our responsibility as citizens of the world to understand the inequalities that exist to actually hope to change the world. So tonight we will welcome women from around the world, women who are on the front lines and women supporting, helping those on the front lines. Women carrying a torch of freedom and love in places where darkness seems to take over. With this first panel, we will explore how conflicts and situations of incivility exacerbate pre-existing patterns of discrimination against women and girls, exposing them to heightened risk of violations of their human rights. Today, I'm very honored to explore the work of incredible women addressing human rights effects of displacements and women participation in peace building and recovery. First, with a pre-recorded testimonial of Zarifa Ghaffari. She is an Afghan politician and mayor of the city of Maidanshar since March 2019. We will follow uh, after that uh, with a discussion uh, with Rosella Paliukilor, UNHCR's representative for the UK, and also joining us from London as well as Maj Masharawi, CEO of Sunbox Group Limited, joining us from New York. But let's start with the moving testimonial of Zarifa Ghaffari. Zarifa is, again, an Afghan politician mayor of Maidan Shar, and she was the youngest mayor appointed at just 26. Let's watch her story. And until two months ago, I served my homeland, Afghanistan, in public office, like thousands of Afghan women, women who are educated, women who want to and dare to make a difference, women who contribute to make a, the future of all Afghans, women, men, and children a little better every day. Thank you. 
I love to challenge the challenge. Let's fight. Tonight, we're joined by two incredible women to have a discussion on this first panel. Um, first, by Rosella paliuki -Lor. She is the UNHCR NHCR representative for the UK. Um, she is in her post as UNHCR representative for the UK since December 2018. Prior, she had served as director for external relations at UNHCR headquarters in Geneva. She has over 30 years of experience in refugee and humanitarian crisis. She has served a UNHCR in diverse countries' contexts, including Pakistan, Nepal, Iraq, Kenya, Belgium, Hungary, and Italy. Ms. Paliuki Lor has a master's degree in political science, international relations, from the University of La Sapienza in Rome, Italy. We'll be with you in a second. I can also introduce um, the second speaker of this panel, Majd Mashaurawi is the CEO of Sunbox Group Limited. She's a resident of war on Gaza. And Majd Masharawi observed the acute need for access to construction material in order to rebuild damaged buildings and infrastructure. She is part of the women finding uh, and participating to the peace building and recovery of war and torn areas. She developed Sunbox, an affordable solar system that produces energy to alleviate the effects of the energy crisis in Gaza where access to electricity has been severely restricted, sometimes to less than three hours a day. In 2018, she was selected as one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company and won the MIT Pan Arab competition. Our TED Talk has received nearly 1.6 million views so far. In September 2019, Ms. Masharawi and Sunbox Company was awarded the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award. Most recently, Majda scaled up her work with solar to the Gulf area. And I know you're joining us from New York this evening. I mean, this evening for us and afternoon for you. Yes. Great. So thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I have like around 15 minutes, right? Yes, you, you're welcome to, to, to start perhaps telling us your experience on how you went from looking at desolation and decided to, to bring forth something that was a solution to a, an extremely devastated area. Yeah. Thank you so much again for having me part of this conference. Uh, I was so excited, uh, especially it's, uh, it's focusing a lot on women and, and women rights and women activities worldwide. So it's a pleasure to be on this panel. I would also uh, recognize names and women. Uh, so thank you, thank you. Uh, my name is Majd, and I'm a Palestinian from Gaza. I was born there. I grew up in Gaza. And um, what I can say is I just came from a community or a society that um, lacks everything. Water, access to clean water, access to energy, access to proper health care, um, high education, and most of all, freedom. Um, and since I was a kid, I was always curious about how the world looks like outside of this small cage. Uh, when the blockade started in Gaza in 2016, I was less than 14 years old. And I, I told my dad, hey, dad, I want to see the world. And he said, just forget about this idea. Get it out of your head. This is not going to happen because we are a block. I've never accepted this fact. And I always wanted to compare the world outside of this small uh, cage which is like 25 miles long and 15 miles wide, and the world outside. So my curiosity drove me uh, when I was like 14 and 15 years old to um, create a social campaign uh, against the civil war that happened in Gaza. So I gathered university students and I became, to under I became to understand how my society is constructed, how the people think in such a young age. Also, my parents provided me um, with like really great access to different languages, education, and we were living like a few blocks away from the largest camp in Gaza Strip. So I was aware of like how the camp life is, how the family, what kind of food the families eat, what kind of services they lack. 
Um, so when I graduated from high school, I decided to be an engineer because I was looking for a faculty that combines between innovation and the practical life. And I wanted to use this faculty as a road for me to bathe towards to bathe different things towards my big dreams, which is why we cannot have a country, what kind of a state we wanted to have, how young people and young women can participate in different challenges inside the community. So during my college, I've started a couple of companies and small startups, and I exited it, exited it. And the largest one, the biggest one was Green Cake. Our house was partially destroyed in 2008 and 2012 wars in Ghana. I lost two of my best friends who were, we, we were circulating their birthday one day before they passed away. And that really drove me to see, to, like, to do different things, to, to take this as a challenge to change the current situation we live, we live in. So I started the, started the first, the biggest company, which is Green Cake in order to provide new kind of building blocks made out of rubble and ashes from the demolished houses inside Gaza. I had no business background. Again, I came from a engineering background, but I taught myself also these skills through different online uh, channels, YouTube videos, and different resources. With the limited resources we have in Gaza and the limited access to the outside world, I was able to rebuild for, for thousands of people their houses and I came up with this, with this patentable idea. I was the first woman who ever went to factories inside Gaza to produce a blouse and hire men to work for the company. It was very challenging in the beginning and people won't accept it at all. They were like, again, instead, some people did not even give me the trust to do so, but I had belief in myself. I knew someday at one, and one day, this will be a step towards the outside world and I will be able to travel outside. I've I've tried for almost eight years to get outside of Gaza. I was rejected so many times. And in order to get out, you need to obtain different four, per, four permits and coordinations. I never gave up. Every year and every time I was rejected, it gave me more power and more energy to reapply again. So in 2017, uh, I managed for the first time to get outside of the smallest trip, the largest open air prison. And I went through United Nations Refugee and Working Agency to Japan to refine my product. I will never forget the feeling that day. I felt like a bird flying out of a cage. Uh, I was so happy. I was like 22 and I could not sleep for like the 18 hour flight. I had a lot of energy. <laughs> and, and it just, every time I think this moment, it gives me so much hope in the future. I went back to Gaza after two weeks from Japan and taking someone from Gaza to Japan was unfair uh, in, so, in so many different aspects uh, because, you know, coming from a society that has nothing to a place uh, that has light, technology, people, finance, entrepreneurship board. Um, and, and again, like this did not, let, did not get me down. I was like, we should be like this country and other countries outside one day. It was my first time to see bridges different cars, people who don't speak English, people who, who don't speak Arabic, people are not from my own religion, they don't dress up like me, and they are different, okay? So that, that year really flipped my life, and I decided to study business. Um, and this is how I managed to get to the United States in 2017, into a fellowship in Boston, and I started my business life from that moment. So, yeah, that's it. in awe of all you've managed to accomplish and how you participate every day to peace building and recovery. You're, you're a phoenix. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so uh, much. Rosella, I know you're here and I know you have such an incredible knowledge of the situation of human rights, of women's rights, but also of, of the global perspective that it represents today for all of us. Perhaps you can tell us how and and how how you're working every day and what you're trying to build uh, towards more fair and more more fair rights for women, but also more equality. Thank you very much, Nora. Uh, it's, it's great to be here, and I'm really and I'm really impressed by what I heard from Majd. Uh, I think uh, it, it also reflection, quite frankly, about uh, how undeservedly privileged I've been uh, 
in uh, uh, in having granted to me what uh, what Majd has had to fight so so hard for. First of all, the freedom to go around. Uh, I mean, you're you're really an inspiration, Majd. <laughs> The uh, so uh, what do we do? When we I work for the unit for the refugee agency. So what we do is try to ensure that refugees of whatever gender, of course, uh, have access uh, to uh, to the rights uh, that first of all the right to seek asylum for persecution, and of course uh, uh, many of the refugees are women indeed, and uh, uh, and displacement for women uh, as well as persecution for women has a somewhat different uh, different twist, which for many years was actually not fully recognized. Uh, I think for many years the, the sense was that a refugee uh, tended to be a man because uh, men were associated with political expression. Uh, it's a relatively uh, a relatively new development, let's say, well, say the few, the few maybe 15, 20 years that there's been an increasing understanding of the fact that persecution uh, targets women differently, uh, but not less seriously, and very often more so. Uh, I think we've seen, uh, uh, we've seen it particularly now with the, uh, with, with the situation in which so many refugees um, are actually fleeing from war, and war has become, is very often a war against women, a uh, war which sees the incredible levels, levels of uh, violence against women, and in an area, in, a, in, a, in the in, an, in, an, in aspects that very often turn them from, from but having, been, having been victims of violence, they end up being also ostracized by their communities. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, when you're talking about, for example, sexual and gender violence, it's one of those few crimes in which very often it's the, it's the victim and not the perpetrator who is, uh, who is blamed by, by communities. But women, of course, are particularly in jeopardy also when they, when, during the flight, when they are, of course, uh, uh, more vulnerable to, uh, to attacks and exploitation, but also when they arrive in a country of, of asylum. And, uh, and this is true, actually, sometimes even when you're talking about women who find asylum in uh, uh, developed countries such as the UK, where women often have lesser access, less access to services uh, and less freedom than they might otherwise have, simply by reason of the fact that they may have trouble with uh, with, with English, where they may they may be uh, stuck with uh, you know with uh, many children at home and therefore unable to to uh, engage with the, exi- with the outside world in the same way that men are. COVID has been a particularly challenging time, well for everyone of course, but uh, it has really exacted a particular toll on women. And, and here I would say, not ju- and of course, not just refugee women. I think we are seeing uh, uh, increasing, increasing levels of, violence, of domestic violence inside the home as women got trapped uh, sometimes in, within, uh, within abusive families. And, and of course, because very often women have the kind of jobs that rely on, uh, on personal presence. And of course, uh, they found themselves uh, uh, more more subject to uh, more li- more likely to be to be without jobs and therefore without means of livelihood. But before I sound like all, I'd also like to recognize that the fact that uh, we have seen over and over again that uh, uh, the the relative vulnerability that women have in many in many aspects should not be should not be equated to a general vulnerability. Women are incredibly resilient, resilient. And I think we, what we have seen very often, for example, in refugee camps that at least uh, up to maybe 10 years ago were almost the, the default position for the default residence for, for, for refugees. Uh, we have seen that very often women were the, the part of, uh, of the population more, that was more ready to take on new challenges, new, uh, new jobs, to learn new skills, to engage in the communities at the time in which very often men felt uh, disempowered and, uh, uh, and deprived of the role that they were expecting to, to see recognized to them, to them in society. So women have really fought very hard to keep families together and to find new ways of holding the community together. So I'd like to say that uh, in, while, while there, is, you know, there is undoubtedly uh, a societal setup that means that women are more often uh, at the receiving end 
of, uh, uh, of uh, limitations and, uh, and, uh, uh, and mistreatment and discrimination, etc. There is also, at the other hand, you know, a spirit, a, comb a combative spirit and an ability to adapt and to grow that, is really, that really does make the difference for, the, uh, for, for societies. And I'd like to conclude just to say that uh, this is something that the humanitarian sector has recognized. I mean, I remember when we were talking about women in terms of vulnerability alone, and now we're talking about, about women in terms of capacities and resilience. And, uh, uh, and how we have moved, uh, uh, really, the discourse has really moved now towards not just education, which is, of course, the, the key empowerment for, uh, tool of empowerment for kids, for, but also sport. Sport is incredibly empowering for young, for young girls. So it's a way to uh, give them the sort of confidence, uh, a sense of uh, freedom from, from the limitations that many societies impo impose on them. Um, takes them out of this kind of, of the kind of enforcing visibility that in some societies girls are expected to have. So uh, there is really, and of course the question of leadership uh, and empowerment, there are many, many uh, projects and programs, a great deal of attention in trying to give girls a space to grow and to, and to become what they want to be. And this is a, this I think is a, is an incredible change that's taken over uh, that has that has really uh, taken over the humanitarian humanitarian uh, community, and that I think will eventually it will bring fruits not only as as they are in exile but also when they go back home. Honored again to hear you both speak. It's such an inspiring um, testimonial from both of you. Um, you know, there, backstage, there's a lot of women. Um, we, we are speaking of women. We're speaking of the contribution of women. Perhaps you could tell us um, what would be, both of you, in closing, the, the word of advice that you could give to a young little girl just going about her day, um, dreaming about the future. Perhaps, Rosella, you could start. Um, I'm, I, again, as I said, there's a lot of women backstage, uh, young women backstage working. Um, there's a lot of of women right now hoping for, for, for their future. And, and if you had one word of advice, both of you, Mashed and, and Rosella, starting with you in closing. Well, I would say, you know, listen to Majd and to Zarifa. I think, you know, you can't have a better example of women who have defied all odds. And these are very important odds. You know, the man with the sticks and stones waiting for her outside the gar the, the, the uh, outside the, the office of the, of the mayor office or uh, matched the challenge in, in being accepted as a credible uh, entrepreneur because, because she's a woman. I mean, the world is full of incredible examples of very, very, very brave women who have managed to, uh, to win all odds uh, to become something, to make something of themselves that societies were not, was not ready to recognize. So uh, I would say just uh, follow, follow them. There is really a great deal to learn from them. Thank you, Rosella. How about you, Maj? Oh, thank you, Rosella. Thank you for the, the amount of encouragement you've given me and for the work you are doing, actually. I just want to, before the closing, I, I want to follow up with the two points you mentioned, Rosella. The first one about access to opportunities for women. So in 2017, when I had the access to come to the United States and start my second company, which was a solar company, it came out of fame. So I, I, when I came here to the United States, I felt that I'm responsible for my society and I, I have to present. And this is what most of the women do. So women always feel dedicated to their societies more than men. This is yeah. also from my work experience. Plus, if they put their head in something, they will definitely do it. I always say, if you want to create a nation, just educate one woman, and then that's it. Leave the rest to her. So when I started my second company, the Sandbox Company, it came out of pain. I spent five years of college studying on a candle. I've witnessed hundreds of people lost their kids because of candles, and they burned, you know, the kids were killed, they died, and the mom and the father, and so many houses, they just, they were lost because of the fire. Um, so when I decided to start this company, I said, this is, this is going to be a hard journey. Creating products in China, shipping it all the way to Ghana and to the West Bank is a crazy process. I've been in meetings with military officials in the Israeli side, 
governmental officials in the Palestinian side trying to get my products across the border in the age of 23. So for me as a woman to present on the, in front of these officials was a hard process. I've been through crazy interrogations, investigations with the Kogad, the IDF and the Israeli side, the government and the Palestinian side asking me why you do this, why do you want to do it? It makes no sense to us. So I was the first woman in this field in my country who paved the road to so many other women in 2017. So now we've been operating for four years. We've done thousands of families. Uh, with, we, we've given them solar energy. We've worked on the desalination plants funded by the European Union. We worked with embassies providing hand, hand up the children with solar technologies. So far, we created an impact for 68 for 68,000 people in Gaza Strip. More than 35,000 people in Gaza are having clean water powered by our solar systems. Our company started from three people. Now we have 15 people in Palestine, four people in Saudi, and two people in the UAE. So this kind of impact, if you, you need someone who's dedicated for it. And that became an example for so many women in the Gaza Strip, I would say even in Palestine and in the Arab country, that women, if they wanted to do something, if they believe in it, they would do it. For me, my company, Sunbox, is like, have, like having a baby to grow it up. There is nothing more precious to a woman than her baby, her kid. Okay? So for me, this company was my kid that I bought all the energy I have just to put it in. So when, when Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award was awarded to me, I said, well, that, that was not my goal to get awards and, you know, to be recognized worldwide. I just wanted to create the local impact, and, and I knew that this is going to be stage for me to speak worldwide. And this is why I'm here today in this conference. I don't think I'm here today because of me, Maj, but because of the impact we created on the ground. So I wanna, well, I wanted to tell so many women around the world, if you want to be heard, heard, if you want the people to listen to your story, you have to create the impact in your local community. You have to see where the pain is, what is your personal pain, as a woman living in a men-dominant men society, what is your pain as like someone who wants to create a change on the ground against all the odds? Like, like such, such a society like Gaza where you have access to nothing plus you're a woman. So it's like a crazy thing to do. But now look at me. Like I don't even have like a state. We don't have a country. We are, we are, occupied, we are occupied. I don't have a passport. I have like a, a travel document. And I went to 25 countries, and here today I'm speaking from New York City. So if you tell someone in Gaza five years ago, Maj is going to be in New York City in a few years, I was like, this is crazy, okay? So now I'm traveling all around the world, expanding the message, delivering the stories of so many women in Gaza. And once you are successful, once the world can hear you, don't forget about other women behind you, who's also in need to, to, for the stories, for their stories to be told. So also a big part of what I'm doing in my society now is advocating for women, sponsoring a lot of women, small startups, uh, getting women outside of Gaza for medication, for education, for so many different things that they are in need of. And um, just believe in yourself. So I, I have like strong belief in myself from day one. I knew I'm going to make it. And I, I know that Sandbox in like coming few years is going to be one of the biggest regional companies in the solar industry. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you, Rosella. I feel so pumped. <laughs> I'm sure everyone in the audience is feeling pumped too. Thank you so sure. much for being part of this first panel. So inspiring. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. For the second panel, we will continue to be uh, incredibly inspired but also we'll continue to address the situation of women within, from a different perspective in a different context. Um, women um, in the front line of crisis is a very loaded um, project to discuss, uh, but we, we're very well surrounded and we have incredible speakers this evening. We will continue with um, yet another um, inspiring uh, pre-recorded testimonial from Veronica Inmunda, an indigenous activist and regional leader of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, Confidenia. Change Now is rooted in action, as we know, but it's also very important for Change Now um, to hear the voices of indigenous people. This is something that is very important to, to the team, to the founder, and it is very important in this time uh, of, our, uh, of our history. Veronica Inmunda, again, is the, the leader of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, CONFINIA. 
she is um, she was born uh, the the project was born from the community specifically the community of Villano Pastaza. She is involved in a youth inspiring movement and in 2017 she co-founded the Pastaza Pachacutic Youth. She was a member of the community board and representative of the OPIP organization currently known as Pakiru. Her participation led her to join Konaye as secretary of the national organization. She is currently the regional leader of the Federation of Indigenous, Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador. From this platform, she has been developing youth strengthening activities in the territories with the participation and support of grassroots organizations that make up the 11 nations and 23 organizations of this region. And her tagline or mantra is a word given, a promise fulfilled. We will start with this video, a pre recorded video of Veronica Inmonda. Mujer Quicho de la Amazonía Ecuatoriana. Soy activista. Nosotros desde los territorios somos quienes estamos protegiendo nuestros, nuestra vida. Para nosotros hablar de conservación es hablar de nuestra vida, de nuestros territorios, de nuestra forma de, de vivir en cada uno de ellos y sobre todo es, es disfrutar de nuestra cosmovisión. Nosotros acá en Ecuador somos 11 nacionalidades y 23 organizaciones donde todos los hombres, mujeres estamos en pie de lucha sobre todo las mujeres, quienes estamos al frente, somos las que más padecemos, porque nosotros somos quienes estamos en los territorios eh, en, haciendo escuchar nuestras voces, porque nuestras voces no son escuchadas, queremos que nuestras voces se escuchen a nivel nacional e internacional, y sobre todo queremos que haya, haya un cambio de conciencia a nivel internacional, a las grandes empresas, quienes están financiando en los territorios, a las petroleras, mineras, quienes están destruyendo nuestra vida, nuestra vida de nuestra fauna, nuestra vida de nuestros animales, la vida de los ríos, que son, son fuente de vida, el río, el aire, somos quienes estamos acá y también somos quienes generamos oxígeno al mundo. Por eso exigimos desde nuestros territorios respeto, respeto hacia la vida humana, respeto hacia los territorios que son cuencas de territorios sagrados. Para nosotros todo es sagrado. La palabra es sagrada y por eso como jóvenes, como mujeres, estamos en primera línea exigiendo que nos respeten y sobre todo que nos dejen a nuestros territorios vivir como nosotros queremos vivir, como vivían hace 528 años nuestros ancestros. Por eso exigimos eso. Estamos nosotros en los territorios eh, con nuestra forma de vida. Queremos nuestra educación propia, también estamos exigiendo que nuestros territorios no sean invadidos por muchas personas que vienen eh, y, y sobre todo destruyen a nuestros eh, territorios, porque al destruir nuestro territorio destruyen el agua, destruyen la vida de cada ser humano. Nosotros somos quienes estamos acá, para nosotros eh, fue muy importante eh, el, los saberes, la medicina ancestral, cuando pasó el COVID, nosotros fuimos, fuimos quienes estuvimos en los territorios y también estuvimos con nuestra medicina natural, que es muy importante porque con ella sobrevivimos en cada uno de los territorios y sobre todo la medicina ancestral, nuestro conocimiento ancestral, pedimos que no sean patentados porque muchas veces son patentados nuestros conocimientos de nuestros sabios, sabias y rucos, eso pedimos y exigimos de que, que nos respeten en nuestro derecho y sobre todo como quienes estamos padeciendo en los territorios, uno por el tema extractivismo minero, petrolero, el tema de hidroeléctricas, otro también por el tema de que nosotros como el ser mujeres indígenas no tenemos eh, 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 voces para que nos escuchen, por eso exigimos que se nos escuchen nuestras peticiones sobre todo los jóvenes quienes están en los territorios como guardianes de la selva, ellos también exigen eso, nosotros la nueva generación los jóvenes, los niños quienes estamos en los territorios eh, en la batalla, nosotros queremos una, 
un ambiente sano, libre y sobre todo nosotros también estamos siendo contaminados, nuestros ríos están contaminados, nuestras mujeres están muriendo con cáncer, nuestra futura generación está en peligro de perder nuestro idioma, nuestra eh, cosmovisión y sobre todo están en peligro nuestros animales, nuestra fauna, nuestros ríos, que el 20% de agua dulce está concentrado en las nacionalidades, en los territorios de las cuencas amazónicas. También decir que nuestros territorios están siendo invadidos y por eso exigimos que eh, no, nuestros territorios ingresen, más bien ustedes que están allá a nivel internacional, pedir a las grandes empresas que ya no financien eh, porque están matando a nuestras, están haciendo un genocidio con las culturas y sobre todo están matando seres vivos, seres que no pueden hablar eh, como el agua, el aire, como los ríos, los animales quienes están muriendo y sobre todo ellos son los que eh, nos, son nuestra fuente de alimento también ¿no? en los territorios y nosotros sobrevivimos con ellos, entonces nosotros por eso exigimos nuestros derechos que sean respetados también nuestra eh, educación nuestra propia, bilingüe, sea respetado por cada uno de los estados, en mi, en mi caso sería por el estado ecuatoriano, que nos respete nuestra forma de vida, nuestra cosmovisión, educación, nuestra, eh, nuestra agua, y sobre todo queremos que eh, el estado ecuatoriano o sobre todo los estados eh, nos den una medida de protección, que, que como pueblos indígenas tengamos un un trato muy especial, porque nosotros somos quienes damos oxígeno al mundo. Eh, se ha comprobado que la mayoría de los, de, de los árboles quienes dan este oxígeno al mundo están concentrados en los territorios de las nacionalidades. Judicael uh, Irakos es una activista feminista y um, ella está uh, articulando su experiencia con las mujeres women y en general el uso. Ella es una organizadora organizer, social, entrepreneur. Uh, she has a record of advocating for children and, women, and women's rights, but also overall human rights. She has worked on different issues ranging from youth development, refugee integration, feminist organizing, uh, community mobilizing. Uh, she's the 2019 European Commission Young Leader on Migration, the G20 Young Global Changer on Gender Equality. She's also an incredible writer. Um, I, I highly recommend that you read some of her articles, very inspiring. Um, starting with you, Romy, perhaps you can tell us more about all the work that you do around PTSD and how you're working on very specific topic, because when we speak of the refugee crisis, we often forget that a lot of trauma is associated with it. Thank you, Nora. Um, what an honor to be here with you and Judy Fayette as well. Um, so, yeah, I am a um, trauma therapist and I tell my clients that the, the reason I do this work is because I genuinely believe in freedom. Um, that is, um, I think, a core value of mine. And I think freedom is a human right. And we need to bridge more of a gap between mental health and human rights because I think mental health should be a human right. You're absolutely correct with, um, I also work, so I work um, in trauma in many different ways. Um, and one of the ways in which I work is with asylum seekers and with refugees. And we very rarely hear about the trauma that exists for people that are constantly on the move and that are constantly waiting. In my work with asylum seekers and refugees, a constant theme that comes up over and over and over again is waiting, waiting to get the papers and then the papers are lost. Um, and then waiting to get, you know, the money for the week, and then that's lost. And that the, the, the system's constant invalidating of a person's process when they're trying to find more freedom is another way of invalidating their experience and invalidating their trauma, if that, if that makes sense. Um, and then I think there is something there about really honoring that in the work that I do and um, doing a lot of psychoeducation with my clients on how to find internal calm in the body when we're working with asylum seekers you know the body is the most permanent home it's our most permanent home it's our forever home so i do a lot of work in equipping them and empowering them to find internal calm when they are physically on the move um in in a and fighting a system they are constantly fighting a system that consistently continues to deny them the human right of freedom 
Um, and I think that is deeply traumatizing and wounding. And the way in which the media portrays them are, you know, number one, the media keeps referring to them as migrants. There is a big difference between a migrant and an asylum seeker and a refugee. But there, that there you have the power of language and there you have, you know, um, again, invalidating a person's experience because a migrant is someone who has chosen to leave. Um, an asylum seeker and a refugee is someone who um, had no other choice but to leave. So that consistent invalidation is something that I see very frequently in trauma, whether it's with asylum seekers or survivors of you know, domestic violence um, and any other forms of abuse. Of circumstances do you deal with on a daily basis? So when it comes to the, I currently work in two different organizations. I work at Orient Eating Disorder Treatment Center in London, where I'm the diversity lead and a psychotherapist. And I also work with Refugee Trauma Initiative, which is an organization which um, focuses on providing therapeutic services in an identity-informed way for asylum seekers. And over there, I work with men. And over here, I work with women and in my private practice with women. And I think my experience of working with women when it comes to trauma has been the idea of caretaker, the woman who caretakes through nurture, the woman who loves too much is something that my clients bring to me a lot. Women whose bodies have experienced and witnessed a lot and continue to contain um, um, for the safety of their family and for the safety of their community. And I think something that's really important when talking about women, I want to talk about the inequities that exist when we talk about women. So I'm a Lebanese woman, um, which is why I do this work because of my history as coming from you know a country in the Middle East. But with women, I think I also experience a lot of women who sometimes feel like they can't take the space to speak about their own experiences because of there isn't the space in by society, so they don't feel like they see themselves represented enough in 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 the books that they read. When we talk about mental health, I don't think there is enough in, um, representation of all types of women. Um, so one of the major works that I do with the diversity lead here is that I'm really working on shifting that within the mental health system and fighting to find equal representation for all types of women for women of color, for women um, that uh, come from different faiths. So for women that, you know, um, might, um, you know, have some form of disability, there isn't enough representation. So the invisibility of female pain um, and the woman being the container and the voice being silenced, um, there's something here about the neck and what, what that part of the body carries and allowing women to um, do this kind of work in therapeutic groups where they can have a community of people witness them and witness what they've experienced and validate it for them. I love how you speak of healing the body and working with these groups of people trying to understand the trauma that they've been through and how it expresses itself through their body. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, um, it's incredibly inspiring because it's not something that you hear often. It's not a topic that's being addressed. We we, we very, very little seek of the un, unseen wounds. Exactly. And, with, and trauma lives in our body. It doesn't live in our head. Um, and our body will carry these memories for us. And, you know, I tell my clients that they are survivors. And, you know, just like if we have a physical wound, our body will do what it needs to to heal it for us. That's exactly what our body does with our emotional wounds. And sometimes for many women, the way that they have been able to heal has been, they have felt the need to be silent because they knew they weren't going to have a witness. And actually, you know, that, that's what I really fight against because I think silence is a form of oppression. So my passion is how do we as a community create safe spaces for people where they feel like if they speak, they are going to be witnessed and validated. So whether that's with survivors, female survivors, whether that's with, you know, male asylum seekers, female asylum seekers, that safe space for witnessing, for the body to feel safe enough to communicate, and it knows it's going to be received and it's going to be held and validated in a contained way. Thank you so much, Romy. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation, but 
I want to get to you, Judy Kael. When we spoke yesterday, we had uh, an incredible exchange where you explained to me how your status, your, your own status as a woman and as a traveler, changed over the course of your life. You first went to the United States as an immigrant and um, ended up being a refugee because you couldn't go back to your country. And that made me think a lot about how we can take our status for granted and how things can change in your own country so quickly that you have no place to go. Um, just like the famous book says, you can't go home again. Um, Judy Kael, you probably will say the, the story much better than I just tried to summarize it. Perhaps you can tell us how, how you come about all the work that you do and what does it mean for you to be a person moving in the world today as a woman? very personal, especially the work that I do with um, asylum seekers, refugees, and immigrants overall. It's very personal. Um, so I migrated in the U.S. as a, a personal choice. I was going to school. Then a few years later, I became an asylum seeker, then became a refugee. Then a few more years, I was in exile because I was blacklisted by my country because of my work. So those are things that quickly happened in my life. Um, as a young woman who was finding her voice, finding how she can contribute into her communities. And that can take a toll um, into a person who was also navigating the racial reality of America. And now you have your own country that has its own political crisis. And you don't belong, you don't feel like you belong in the culture settings of the United States. Now you also don't have a home anymore. Um, and how much that affects the everyday life of a person. So I started doing work with refugees out of searching my own identity as a person who felt like I don't have a home anymore. And because for me, I felt like home was a stable place. Then when I started working with refugees, it became more intense as Romy was talking, the, the realization that people are living waiting like meeting someone who has been in refugee camp for 20 years, waiting for the day UN migration will show up and get them out of the refugee camp. And, and to think about refugee camp, you have to understand that these are not communities involved with other communities. They put refugee camp on the borders. Like the refugee camp I work in is on the border of Uganda and Tanzania. In fact, when you enter the refugee camp, there's no road. The road to the city stops and then you enter a very crazy road, hard to drive in. That's where the refugee camp starts. And you have people, young kids who were born in the refugee camp are older now and they don't know any other life. All they have done their entire life is to wait, to wait for that country that will decide to work with the UN migration and pick them and finally give them a home. And that is not the reality that a person should live in. And that would be my reality if I was not in the States already as a student when that political crisis happened back home. So it, it, really, it really is personal when I do this work because I'm hit by the reality that my life could change any time. Yes, it's, it's very interesting that you bring up your own personal journey into the work that you do and how it helps you. And I think, Romy, you, you mentioned that as well. Um, what, what I find really fascinating is that when you're exposed to um, the refugee crisis on a day-to-day -day basis in which you experience, sometimes you become um, it's business as usual. And for people that, that don't experience it or have never been to a refugee camp or have never spoken to a refugee, it's a foreign territory. Perhaps for the audience that's, that's hearing us today that have, haven't been exposed or doesn't really understand the scope of your work, perhaps you could share one moment that has been so fundamental in the work that you do and that you shared in stories, perhaps, trying to express what it feels like to be a refugee today. What, what the scope of the work do, uh, that you do around the refugee crisis? Starting with you, Judy Kael, perhaps. Um, so there's a story, I've talked about it, I want to share it, because that particular story has been the reason why I can't stop working with refugees. Of course, the work with refugees has become trauma to me a lot because there's a lot of pain and losses that I've experienced. But in 2016, that was my first time in a refugee camp. I was documenting the sexual experiences, the sexual abuse that most women are going through um, when they are migrating, especially during forced migration. So I was documenting the exact experiences that this refugee women were going through. So as I document, I passed through a house. There was an older woman that was living there. She 
she was she would never speak to anybody she would just come and sit outside so i passed through her house nobody introduced me to her nobody would say hello to her she was just sitting outside so i decided to sit with her i feel she was intriguing me somehow so i sat with her the whole day she did not talk to me she did not say hello to me she just sat there quiet and then when the sun goes down she will enter she entered the house the second day i returned i found her outside as well i sat outside with her and then around like 11 she spoke she said do you drink tea i said yes Oh, and she spoke to me in my own language. And I was like, oh, that's nice. She's Burundian. And then she was like, okay, let me make you something. She brought me tea. And then she asked me, did you know my daughter? I said, no. And then she said, let me tell you what happened to my daughter. She told me how when the political crisis started, the police raided her home and took her 15-year-old. Um, and, and while they took her, they raped her, the mother in front of the daughter. And then disappeared. Two days later, she found the daughter in the street, her body parts apart. She took her body, cleaned her kids, and buried her. And she left for the refugee camp, trying to save her life. And since that day, she has never spoken about that particular story. All she does is come outside and sit. As she was narrating the story, I was crying, crying, but no tears were coming from her face. She was telling me the story as if she has read it somewhere. And that broke my heart entirely. And then after she kept quiet, the sun goes down, she left. The third day I returned, I went to sit with her. But also I returned because of, I don't know, I was feeling bad that she was sitting alone. When she saw me, there's one thing she told me. She said, nobody ever comes to sit with me again after hearing my story. That is the reality of being a refugee, and nobody ever comes back to you after they handed you the small help that they think you need. Nobody ever comes to you to hold your hand and tell you it's okay. You know, it hurts to live on token foot. These are people who deserve housing, people who have dreams, people who even before political crisis, economic crisis, or climate change started in their country, they had lives, you understand. But all of a sudden, everything changed. Now, they're living at the mercy of token food. They're living hoping that one day somebody will come and give them a life. And for her to tell me that nobody ever come and sit with me after hearing my story, it breaks my heart because for some, it's just a story to hear and you move on with your life. Nobody ever comes back to them. So I think for me, all the time that I feel discouraged because it's a lot and because also refugee work in, in, in most of the East African countries, it's underfunded. So most of community organizations don't do the work, don't do much because they don't have funds. Like I could imagine most of the things that we do are crowdfunding, like reaching out to people in the community on how they can really support us or be part of the work that we're doing. So most get discouraged, but also the trauma and the pain is too much. So most people run away and it's understandable. But also I think on how most of survival for women has to be collective, you know, yeah, that absolutely. Now, the violence that women and girls go through alone. Like you need a community to survive and refugee women and girls need a community to survive. Like now I think about Rwanda has just a lot of Afghan women now. And yeah. I can imagine how much it means for them to have a community that actually cares and is interested for them to, to, to like strive and continue to have a life. Thank you, Jijikael. How about you, Romy? I wanted to respond to a few things that you said, um, Jijikael, in terms of the story. I think that's something that I find a lot um, in my work when it comes to trauma that one of the main things I see over and over again is when somebody is traumatized, when they're recounting their story, it's always as if they're recounting it as if it happened to someone else. And that's a survival mechanism that our body adopts to keep us safe. And there is something here about witnessing that's really, really powerful. And it's reminding me of, um, in the work that we do with, with um, asylum seekers, there's something that, I, that I've started noticing in the group that I work in, is that it gets to a point where we start getting internalized dehumanization and internalized racism. And I think it's important that, that I name that when working with asylum seekers, there is a difference. Seekers are treated. The darker skinned you are, the less rights you are given. So I think it's important that we address the racial element here as well. 
um, that you named earlier, Judith, when you were speaking, because I don't think that's spoken about enough, and I think it needs to be, because lighter skinned asylum seekers are treated better than darker skinned asylum seekers as well. And there's something that I see happen over time in working in this field, which is that, you know, people start internalizing the way the system treats them as maybe I am less than. That worthlessness with that token, being given tokens for food, you know, wait, sitting outside and, and not having somebody come back to witness your story. You know, as human beings, the, the questioning starts being, maybe, maybe I'm not as worthy. And that is the work that I do when I work with RTI, a lot of the work that we do is we work on that internalized dehumanization. We, worked on, we work on the internalized racism and specifically on acts of resistance, those small acts of resistance that we can empower our clients to go and do. For example, there's this one um, Cameroonian um, asylum seeker who works in Greece who was given, who was given less money than the Greek workers because he's black. That's literally what he was told, right? So his act of resistance was saying, well, then I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this job again because I deserve to be paid e as equal to someone else. And now it's about supporting him to go and find a job where he will be paid equally to other people. But that was a big dilemma for him because he needed the money. So it's, it's constantly, how do we, in this field, how do we sit and bear witness to this pain? But also, as a therapist, one of the biggest parts of, of my work is challenging the internal narrative that starts happening as a result of the external and the way the system treats asylum seekers and refugees. So that's a really beautiful story, Judy Kayel, about coming back to her, right? Going back and being like, I'm here to witness your story. And... The, the group that, um, which is with male asylum seekers that we do, run by two women, Gabriella Brent and I, for RTI, was a group that it was really interesting starting it because it's working with male asylum seekers and we asked them to find a private space and many of them were in camps in Greece and they said, that's going to be impossible. How are we going to find a private space for an hour and a half to do online therapy? And interestingly, they did and they have. They found a way to negotiate space for themselves. And this group has been going on for about a year now and continues. So there is something there about when given community that is going to consistently come back to you, whether it's with women that, you know, collective healing, we can only heal in community. Asylum seekers often migrate in community. There is something about that movement that needs to happen. Um, but that internalized dehumanization and internalized racism I thought it was very important to talk about because that, for me, is the most powerful part of therapy in this, in this field, challenging that internal narrative because nobody can own how, you know, what goes on in your body after an incident. And I think the work with trauma is about challenging that and challenging the system at the same time. Thank you both so much for this beautiful, the beautiful stories that you just shared with us and, and all the work that you do. Um, around this, this very important topic of the refugee crisis, women's rights. Um, there's a beautiful quote that says the, that women are the light of the place. And I feel like you're bringing a lot of light into the spaces that you're in and, and the countries that you work in and, uh, and the topics that you're approaching. Thank you so much um, for, for participating this evening. And, uh, and I wish you great, great courage and great luck for the continuous work that you do. going to cover different topics and for that I call for first a uh, Cressy, Cressy Westling who's the co-founder of Elvis and Cressy. Uh, she's also a Cartier Women's Initiative Fellow uh, from 2011 and her topic is definitely waste. This is the crisis she's trying to, to manage. Uh, hi, hi, hi Cressy. Hi. We also have Ana Luisa Becerra. Um, she's the CEO of Safe Drinking Water, uh, and the crisis she's trying to, to solve is definitely the one about water uh, and access to water. Hi, hi Ana Luisa. 
Hi, and hello. then hi. And then we have also Celine Yigit Basi, founder and CEO of Goodstead. And her fight is more about social impact and how to gather forces to have a bigger impact. Hello. Hello. So very, very happy to have you here because it's always um, a privilege to have such a, a selection of great change makers. And so I would like to start with you, Chrissy. Um, so about waste, how did you happen to finally uh, give a purpose to uh, in your life, you know, to, to fight the, the waste uh, and the, let's say, the society of disposable? Um, I think, I think sort of my journey with waste started a very long time ago. You know, I was uh, often going to the, the dump with my dad on a Saturday. Um, and I, I grew up in Western Canada, so miles and miles and miles and thousands of miles from the sea. But the dump was the only place where there were seagulls, which I found really fascinating. And I've always retained that fascination. You know, in our in the last two to three generations, we've invented waste. Our great great grandparents didn't really produce any, so this disposable culture uh, is is a relatively new phenomenon. And I'm always wondering how did we how did we get here? How can we get away from here? And one of you know my I guess my key response to it and why I've started the business that I have uh, back in 2005 was to just point out to people that even materials that were so unloved and seemed so valueless could be turned into really cherishable, um, durable, long-lasting items and could do a lot of good, could create wonderful jobs. You know, 50% of our profits go to charity. There's a, you know, a whole host of, of wonderful ethical things that we do. And, and we do all of that with waste. And it, the idea is really to help foster cultural change. Amazing. And so can you tell, tell a bit more about where concretely you're doing? Uh, I believe this is uh, a lot to see with firemen. It's just the teaser. So <laughs> you, you yes. Can, you can go on. So we started, I mean, when I first moved to the UK, I did lots of research into the waste here. And I discovered there was 100 million tons going to landfill. And this was an inconceivable amount to me. So I thought, I've got to go and see what that looks like. So I spent about four months um, touring various landfill sites in the UK, and that's when I saw a fire hose. Now, fire hose gets decommissioned when it becomes 25 years old, and then it starts to it fail its health and safety test, or if it's too damaged to repair. But it's still this insanely durable material that is actually very similar to a material used by a couple of French luxury brands. And I thought, why, why should we be generating new synthetic high-grade synthetic rubber like this, particularly for the luxury industry, when decommissioned fire hoses are everywhere. So the, the business was set up specifically to rescue London's damaged decommissioned fire hoses. Um, we started with belts, we moved on to bags, wallets, and accessories. And since day one, 50% of the profits have gone to the firefighters' charity. Um, that's fantastic. And I think that one of the things that inspires me uh, most in, in what you're doing, actually, because when I discovered what you were doing, I was saying, wow, what's amazing is that um, your ambition and vision are super large, meaning that, mm. uh, for example, um, I, I read somewhere that um, now that you are covering that, like all the um, host pipes in London, um, you have now another goal, other goals to add on other materials, maybe to to uh, to go towards the same path. Uh, yes. There is this in terms of ambition and also in terms of vision. I think that um, you apply uh, also in your everyday life uh, this theory, of, well, this fight against the disposable and going back to more uh, to nature. Those two points. Yes, so I think the, the really fascinating thing, and listening to this, who, who has an idea that they might want to be an entrepreneur, the really interesting thing that I've always loved about business is that if you can make enough money to keep the doors open, then you can do pretty much whatever you want, and, and no one tells you to stop doing it. So 
We started with fire hose. We now rescue 15 different materials. We collect the waste leather from Burberry. We collect um, printing gla blankets from the printing industry. We collect coffee sacks, uh, failed parachute panels, just a huge list of materials. And each one of them has required a lot of R&D to transform into something amazing. And each material involves um, a charitable partnership. So from our leather rescue project, we create scholarships for women to train as solar engineers. And that's been a hugely successful project for us and for the, for the women involved. But, but the mission obviously expands. You know, we started this 16 years ago and every success that we had made us feel two things. One, that the luxury industry has still represents a structural failure to me because it's supposed to be about creativity and actually it's involved in the destruction of the environment and the degradation of its people. If you look through the supply chains, through the pace and the processes that it uses. And we thought rather, you know, of course we're focusing on our raw materials, but actually the focus is much wider. It's on changing the industry. It's on, you know, being very vocal about being a social enterprise, about being a B Corp, about being the kind of business that puts impact people and planet above profit. You know, we don't, we don't celebrate profit. When people ask me what my turnover is, I will always tell them in tons of poses or in charitable donations because I think we need a cultural change in order to start redefining what success is. Because to me, you know, money is relatively empty. It's just a grease in the wheels to keep you going. And then, you know, you, you, you mentioned the farm. Certainly, I don't think there's there's probably anyone, everyone who's listening is aware of these two massive existential threats that we, we face as a civilization, and that's climate change and biodiversity loss. And, you know, there's a, there are some typical corporate responses to that, which are, well, let's have a sustainability team and let's reduce our impact. Well, or let's offset our CO2. And, and Elvis and I always take a direct hands-on approach. So over the course of pandemic, we, we moved our entire operation to a farm and we've started a regenerative agriculture project. You know, the idea for us is for the business to be a net regenerative business, a net giver to um, biodiversity. You know, we've completely changed the landscape here to make it a biodiversity hotspot. Um, and also to, to, through regenerative agricultural practices to rebuild soil health and to sequester carbon into the soil. So we're not offsetting any, we're not asking anyone to do this work on our behalf. Um, you know, literally, literally we, we, we're going to be, us and our team are out in the field doing it. And I think a lot of businesses, if they want to, tr to truly have an impact on climate change, have to tr start transitioning their business models into being very solution focused, particularly with regards to climate change and biodiversity loss. Yeah, perfect transition. To be solution focused, this is exactly what we're trying to, 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 to be right now in this session. And for the um, next topic, uh, I'd like to travel to Brazil. Uh, and so I'd like to have Ana Luisa uh, with us here. Hi, Ana Luisa. So, can you tell us a bit more about? Um, um, you, you sometimes I, I read sometimes that you are the girl who wanted to solve the water problem in the world. Uh, that's super ambitious, and at the same time, I think that ambition is key in everything we we want to solve. If we want to to manage some uh, manage to to get to some to somewhere. So, Ana Luisa, can you tell us a bit more? Start to, to saying that um, to dream big and to dream small, we. Uh, spend the same amount of energy and thinking. So uh, for us in STW, we know that uh, water problem is a really big challenge and uh, not a standard. Yeah, yeah. I hear you back. That's good. You, you are, can you hear me? Yes, that's it. Oh, <laughs> so uh, for us, uh, we right now we are still small. We have been impacting about uh, 13,000 people in Brazil, but the water and sanitation issue affects more than 2 billion people. So uh, we still have a very, very long journey 
and with that uh, our our ambition is not only to grow and impact but to inspire more people more companies more organizations to work in, in, in sanitation sector so we can have very scalable solutions implementing and changing the lives of those who need it the most. Um, water access is a human right, and we know that uh, when it's not, uh, uh, it's not a reality, when it's, uh, it's scarce and it's not safe to drink, it can generate a lot of problems, mainly talking about um, health, education, and it affects mainly the women's because usually in uh, countries uh, that has this issue, the women, the mothers are the responsible to get water and to treat uh, uh, and to how they are sick. So we have uh, a lot of problems because of this. Um, and when we, we can solve it through innovative, sustainable solutions such as that ones that we work in SCW, for example, we have Aqualus, a uh, technology that uh, only uses some energy to clean the water and lasts for 20 years. So we have this huge impact, uh, very durable and sustainable, talking about environmental also, uh, for a problem that affects uh, millions of people worldwide. Um, that's our main approach, but uh, for the future, we hope to implement a lot of other technology. Um, for example, blockchain, uh, we are projecting a social token to help uh, the scale not only of our solutions, but solutions that can address the water issue very effective. And for now, well, the problem that they are facing is the low amount of um, uh, opportunities, finance for them to be able to reach those who needed the water and sanitation. Is that um, you are working on the solution and at the same time uh, on inspiration. You, you mentioned that you wanted to inspire uh, people to, to solve this uh, issue. Um, one of the things that I think are truly inspiring uh, in your uh, journey is that at age 21, you've been named a young champion of the earth by the U United Nations. Um, how did that help? Um, what, what came after that? So uh, I would say uh, where we were before the prize and where we are after the prize. Because before receiving this international recognition that is really huge, we were trying to have partners, we were trying to have uh, funding to develop our technology, and no one were believing in our potential. For then, I was just a small girl, a young girl, trying to uh, play of scientists. I wasn't taken seriously. After this important recognition, a lot of things uh, changed a lot. Um, uh, I would say that uh, doors that we were trying to open suddenly opened for us uh, after the, this UN recognition. So um, it's something that uh, we right now we have this uh, 13,000 of people impacted just because uh, we got an international recognition and suddenly people start to believe that uh, what we were doing was serious and could uh, save uh, and help a lot of people, not only in Brazil, but around the world. Oh, thanks. Thanks for, for this uh, uh, great explanation of how that brought a lot of traction to what you're doing. Uh, now I'm going to turn uh, towards uh, Celine, uh, Celine founder and CEO of Goodstead. Um, so here we are more about how to um, create bigger social impact by, trying, by inspiring other people to, to get into action. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about Goodstead? And it's essentially, um, you can think of it as a social network for collaborating to create a better world. 
So it's open for individuals to join for free and anyone leading a nonprofit or an impact startup can join for free as well to ask for support. And uh, with, what's interesting is that we decided to build Gifted as a software solution to make it easy for program managers to also engage their communities and report on their engagement and impact. Um, this also helps us make the platform financially sustainable and reach larger communities of individuals and projects. Um, so one use case which we're focusing on is actually helping um, companies who need a solution for engaging their employees in their social purpose. And we do this by simply helping them connect their employees with opportunities for volunteering and helping to keep track of the engagement and impact. Um, and for this, we focus on skilled volunteering. For example, if you're great at marketing or comms, you can use this skill to help a nonprofit uh, with their comms campaign. And of course, there are other opportunities uh, as well on the platform. It depends on which organizations or projects are registered and engaging. Um, and for example, last year, we had an opportunity posted to gather supporters for writing letters to the elderly um, to help them feel less isolated during COVID lockdown, which was great. And I won't go into more detail about the other use cases, but as uh, mentioned, we also work with communities and organizations who already have access to beneficiaries and supporters. Uh, we simply help reduce the administrative burden of tracking engagement um, and reporting on impact. Our platform's in beta version right now. Uh, we launched it last year, but we already have clients, partners, and over 2,000 members using the platform. Um, so yeah, finally, to summarize, we're on a mission to create a multi-stakeholder platform where every member of society can easily take part in social and environmental progress. Um, and we're currently looking to connect with companies who are happy to offer their employees days off to volunteer and take part in causes. So if you're one of them, um, please get in touch. So if I make it short, you are trying to, to solve the issue of waste of talent. Uh, somewhere, I would say. Uh, I, I just have a, a data. <laughs> I have a data which is that um, around 80% 80, 80 of people would like to have an impact and get involved in something uh, socially or environmentally um, oriented. But only between 10 to 20% of people really do something. Um, how, with Goodstead, uh, you manage to to um, convince people to, to get part, uh, to, to, to change? Yeah, so that's a, um, uh, the, a stat, stat that we also uh, talk about quite a lot. Um, there's um, a huge kind of um, talent pool that are ingrained in companies. Uh, and what we do is we help um, employees in companies as well as other individuals in communities to easily get onto the platform, have their profiles up there, tell us um, on their profiles what they're interested in and what their skills are. And then we connect them with uh, exciting and inspiring impact startups, founders of impact startups and nonprofits who are really looking for support to progress with their challenges. Um, and we easily connect them on the platform. It acts a bit like a social network um, but we all have all the processes in place. So when you support uh, an opportunity on the platform, you immediately get connected to the founder um, and then you give your support. And at the end, you get a chance to exchange recommendations and feedback. And all of this gets collated on the feed of the platform um, and it motivates other people to take part. So it's all about creating that transparency and exposure and showing the collective impact that we can create if we all take part. Um, in causes and share our skills. Well, that's definitely exciting. Um, for the last three minutes of this uh, of this panel, uh, I would like just to to get back to each one of you uh, for a question and around one minute each one. Um, my question is: What would be the advice you could give to the the would be change makers that are listening to us, um, Cressy? Maybe to to start with it. are focused on solutions because we love the problems that we've chosen to solve. So I recommend you read through the UN SDGs and you, you sort of examine your heart and you look at which one of these problems could you dedicate your life to and which, maybe more importantly, which one of these problems is matched to your skill set. 
um, which one do you think is that you know a lot about, you can learn a lot about? Because if you're married to the problem, you're going to keep adapting the solution and you're going to stay resilient. Um, it's certainly all the entrepreneurs that I know in the impact space who, who have stuck around are the ones who love their problems. Oh, thanks. And Alisa? And complete, I completely agree with Chris. And um, to add, I, I would say that uh, it's important to start with what you have. You don't need to start complex. You don't need to, of course, we are going to dream big. We are going to imagine a lot of fantastic things. But we need to make sure that uh, we can work with what we have. If we just have like a hundred uh, uh, euros or dollars to start, we need to make something to start with that and then grow and collect partner, grow a network to help you achieve your goal and mainly solve your problem. Thanks, Annalisa. And maybe Celine for the closing word. Perfect. Um, I would say that this is the time to push to drive action for causes you really care about. And if you have an idea for an initiative, then try to pilot it on a small scale and look to partner with others to see how you can create the biggest impact. And if you don't have an idea, but if you're really keen to use your skills to progress a specific cause, um, then there are actually many nonprofits and impact startups out there who would immensely benefit from your input. And finally, be transparent in what you want to achieve and be yourself. And this would be one of the biggest recommendations I could give, actually. Being yourself and being open helps build strong and long-term relationships, which lead to meaningful collaboration and helps amplify your voice. Being yourself. Well, thanks, thanks to the three of you uh, for this discussion that was uh, totally energizing. Uh, here at Change Now, we see a lot of change makers. Uh, but uh, it's always super energizing to have this kind of discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, now we are, we're getting to the end of this uh, evening together. Um, and I wanted to say a few words of, of thank you and a few closing words. Uh, first of all, I wanted to, um, well, to say thank you to all the speakers who participate here uh, today. Uh, thank you to Nora, Nora from Who Cares? Uh, who moderated the, the sessions uh, just uh, earlier. Uh, thank you to the technical team here. You don't see them, but uh, thank you to, to the technical team. Special thanks to uh, Lacazen, Maeva Bessis from Lacazen, who uh, hosted us here uh, when we had to change plans. And thank you to the Change Now team, who made a great and fantastic job in gathering uh, such amazing speakers uh, tonight. Um, also, I would like to underline the value of collaboration. And that's why I want also to, to give a warm thank you, uh, thanks to uh, our partners, Cartier Women Initiative, UN Women, He for She, One Young World, Women in Tech, and UNHCR. Um, it's only because we are doing all these together, the support you bring to, to this program, that we managed to, to deliver this kind of quality of content. So thank you. Um, now the second edition of, uh, of the Women for Change program is launched. Uh, many other uh, rendezvous will, will come later in the year uh, in our relentless determination to, to put light and help those who are really changing the world. Um, to finish, I take also this opportunity to announce um, the next edition of Change Now, our global summit. Uh, it will take place in May, from the 19th to the 21st of May 2022, uh, in a renewed format in person uh, on the Champ de Mars, going from the Grand Palais Ephemer to the first floor of the Eiffel Tower. So we expect you there if you want to, to be part of this huge community of change makers. Um, the program will have a lot of surprises, an extended program with this multi-site uh, format. And as a closing word, I would just would like to, to share uh, something that also struck me. Uh, Nora told something about light earlier. And I believe that the different uh, change makers we've seen tonight um, are like candles that are some light, showing that light prevails on darkness. And I believe that every one of us here 
by being more caring, by being more linked to uh, nature and to the other, um, have or are is called to 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 be somewhere light. And I just want to to leave you with this idea. And I and I say thank you very much for listening to us, for watching us, and see you soon. Thank you.